this is Maypole Forest Garden. Obviously, we're on Maypole Road. Maybe once upon a time, they used to cut trees for the Maypole along here. Um, so our social interaction with land is very important. As we all know, farming and isolation is a, a, a major factor in depression in the farming communities. So, you know, we need to reconnect with land again instead of have this distant kind of just purely commercial relationship with land so here some of our various trees coming on we have a whole variety of fruit trees which help with cross-pollination we have quite a lot of crab apple trees as well dotted around the land which are fantastic for so many different species especially as they some of them fall off and rot on the ground and you've got lots of food for in butterflies and so on but also we use crab apples you can turn them into chutney you can turn them into jelly you can use them for lots of different uses um, and then we've also uh, <laughs> dotted across the land. We've got, um, we've got other areas. We, we, we try and do everything natural here as much as possible. We've got compost toilets. Uh, we've got several of them across the land, so it's better for um, obviously visitors, for social, social um, events, and so on. And then we've redug several large ponds on the land, uh, or several pot. Well, this one's the biggest one. So we can capture, we've got the mallard uh, kind of nesting on there at the moment. So we, we, we everything on this land, we, we um, obviously water with rainwater as everybody who uh, grows um, organically knows rainwater is the best with its nutrients. We do in all the trees and all our crops. We do grow some annual crops, but we also have perennial veg on here is like the artichokes and the cardoons and the globe artichokes and things like that you know so that's all um, useful for um, you know they just keep going so you don't have to hardly water them which is all useful so if we just walk back up this way resilient of all the trees and plants been to the recent um, heat yeah, waves I mean, we've had? We found things have been very resilient because the more diversity of trees you have, as we all know, the trees interact with each other and they protect each other of disease. They warn each other through giving off chemicals, warn trees of diseases and everything else. And also if you've got natural land, get more of a um, microsorial fungi kind of mix uh, under the ground and that helps with the tree's health. Um, so there's such a, a mix between the different trees with monoculture farming. It's far more resist, you know, not far less resistant to diseases and pests and everything else. So this system has got more strength and it's res more resilient to extremes of wet. If you get lots of rain, a perennial base crop far more resistant to that. Far more resistant to extensive weeks, several months where we don't get any rain almost here. But it's the trees didn't struggle they they were fine we didn't lose any trees last summer despite it being the the driest summer since 1976 so um so yes this kind of system of agroforestry forest gardening is one of the best ways to cope with the extremes of weather we're getting more regularly now so it's, it's just sensible to have more projects like this all over the country and it also helps massively with uh, community interaction to, with nature which helps mental health which is a major issue in in britain uh, and we need to have more spreading all across the country as many forest gardens as possible what we're passionate about so we've got our um <clears throat> our, just a little shed with some of our tools in there so it's a bit of a messy area i'm just going to tidy it up <laughs> Because obviously we only manage this part time. We're only here um, a couple of days a week. So there's always lots and lots of different tasks in terms of the land and its management. 
And how many people do you have um, in your group? Doing it, mate. Well, Mandy comes every Tuesday. Sometimes we get the other odd volunteer coming. And then on a front, usually two or three of us. So it's fairly small numbers uh, managing it. But it's because forest gardening is so requires so much less time and effort, but you get so much back from it. It gives you so much back in terms of products, resources, right. food, medicine, so on and so on. Uh, for the effort you put in, it's the initial effort of planting it up and mm. you know planning it. That's where most of the effort is, and getting things through the, the first few years when they're more um, vulnerable to extremes of cold or extremes of uh, driver and so on. But uh, it's such a good investment in the long term because this, you know, once the trees are going, fruit trees, you know, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of pounds worth of fruit for one tree. Mm -hmm. You know, some main crop trees where they get, you know, lots of, lot, you know, when they get quite big, not obviously the semi dwarfing ones that get so big, but um, we have got some of them here, but most of them are uh, standard fruit trees. So you get so much back for your investment, so it's so sensible to do it from a, an economic point of view, let alone a, uh, you know, just because organic food so much better for you, so much better for your well-being, you know, you're not consuming all the pesticides, a lot of fruit trees, you know, fruit bushes or whatever that are commercially grown, the amount of times they're sprayed and everything, it's awful, and then you're consuming that and then overconsumption of that can build up in the body and it can cause all manner of health issues or, you know so um, this is it's just so many benefits growing your own you know you know got to, you know it's, we need as many people doing it as possible and what's the um the definition of forest gardening how does it um how is that different from from um you know other ways of growing fruit and nut trees so forest go gardening is all about um um <clears throat> multi-layer systems so it's all about your top canopy, like your top canopy trees. Uh, I mean, for example, your sweet chestnut trees, uh, and then lower down you've got your, say, your main crop fruit trees. And then below that you've got your semi-dwarfing trees. And then below that you've got your fruit bushes, like your, your currants and raspberries and so on. And then below that you've got your ground cover, like your herbs, your mints, your alpine strawberries and so on. So it's a multi-layered system. That, um, a, that the trees aid each other. They work in um, symbiosis, so they help each, they have benefits to each other. For example, we've got an Italian older in this hedgerow, and that helps fix the nitrogen in the ground that benefits other plants around it. Um, certain trees, obviously they benefit other trees because they act as a um, windbreak for other trees, or they give them semi-shade, which some particular plants require more. So it's all about a wide variety. You get climbers like the honeysuckle, which is edible, of course, you know, growing up other trees. So it's about a multi layered system <clears throat> that, that benefits the different plants and trees, benefit each other. This is all hedgerow. So in the, in the hedgerow, we've got like we've got our like bird cherries, we've got uh, hawthorns, we've got um, Rosa Ragosa, uh, which are the Large berries of Rosa Ragosa are very tasty, very high in vitamins. <clears throat> Sorry, I've cut this back recently. We've got a few trip hazards, so just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to clear up some of the cuttings. Um, uh, so I cut things back in the winter because that has the less least impact on, um, on nesting species and obviously the berries and everything. Um, <clears throat> So as the, um, as the forest garden matures, do you have to, how much intervention and management do you have to do? So every week, the main day of intervention and management, in the, between the kind of March time and October, I'm up here roughly six to eight hours a week. So the rest of the time in the past year, I now spend two days a week up here managing it, but that other day has been in terms of we've been doing some building work we've been building a shed up here so so it's just a day a week's management of a whole six acre site it's very like i say forest garden is so low management low intensive work 
uh, it's just such a it's it's like I say you get far more returns for the inputs you put in it's very sensible so you're not having to, having to remove trees or thin out or do things like that so you do do some of that occasionally so <clears throat> We do do some thinning, some pruning back. Um, once a year, we hire a, like a ride on where we go around to cut the main rides to keep them, and we might have to cut fire breaks because when we have droughts in Essex, um, you, you know you're concerned about fire spreading from field to field because we did get a forest fire over a forest about half a mile from here, and we had a field fire over the other side there so you need to do maintenance work like that occasionally and also it, it helps to control the brambles because you don't want certain things like brambles taking over too much so you do have to cut them down and some of the, the dog rows that come up so yeah so we do that once a year the rest of the time we just cut it with hand mowers so it's fairly low fairly low maintenance I'd say for what you get back And what would you say is, um, you've got um, six, six, six acres, acres. Right? what would you say That's is the good. kind of minimum viable plot for if somebody wanted to create their own forest garden area? Uh, you can create a forest garden in you know, a back garden, you know, kind of based on the system. You know, some people have done applied forest garden principles to balconies. Um, so there's a whole range of different sizes. So you could scale it up hundreds of acres or take it down you know to a, 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 a small backyard garden so it's applicable in so many ways I did I ran a uh, community allotment and we did forest gardening on a couple of the plots there applied elements of that so um, it's accessible to anybody really and everybody but um, we can see the new plums starting to come you can see all the fruit at this early time of year early spring this is the sea buckthorn plant it's suckers and um, you get abundant berries off of that. These are the new shoots from the Rose of the Ghost. Huh? They're starting to come. So we look forward to consuming them later in the summer. And the flowers are beautiful as well. You get wonderful big flowers on them. These are the Italian older, the kind of cones you get off of them. And the <clears throat> Some of these things, cones, they're great for decoration as well as the benefits the trees have. There's so many different uses for so many different plants in a forest garden. And the fact that it's mixed with me and it's, um, you know, you have all those uh, different uh, uh, insects that are here as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it's... Um, wonderful the insect life you see through the year that lives you know we leave like say we leave we've got the dead you know trees on the land as they rot they're amazing for all the all the beetles and other bugs and wood lice and so on that live with them um, all the wildflowers we have on this land you know obviously when you get to later in may you get you know abundance of butterflies up here um we could walk we walk up this way um <clears throat> Obviously, we've got um, certain species come back on the land like orchids. Oh, that's um, certain orchids which are beneficial to certain species, which are quite unusual and rare. I can hear the birds. What kind of um, bird that life was, do you that have? Was, well, that was the woodpecker. We've got a family of green woodpeckers living on the land. Still their home on the land. Um, we get lots of uh, song thrush, uh, blackbird, um, green green finch, gold finch. Uh, we've got um, we've got uh, you get the starlings. Uh, we've got sparrowhawks living in one of the nest boxes. We've had barn owls. Um, so we have a whole range of of different uh, bird species. Because they uh, benefit from, you've got lots of, um, obviously the higher insect species you've got, you've got more food for the food chain. So, um, and obviously this ground is ideal for uh, raptors like uh, sparrowhawks and kestrels. 
So we've had kestrels nesting on the land every time. Uh, because, yeah, there's loads of hiding places for voles and other insects and so on. It's just ideal. We've had voles, yeah, we've seen voles nesting in one of our little areas over there. Um, so it's, um, it's, yeah, it's just creating places where there's plenty of the wildflowers and the habitats, you know. We have lots of piles, just brash piles we leave for, you know, so you've got places for hedgehogs and grass snakes. We've had the grass snakes sleeping in our compost heaps. We found them sometimes, we leave them alone because they overwinter in them before they warm up a bit in the spring and they come out to play. Um, so, uh, yes, it's, even though it looks a little bit messy sometimes, the forest garden, it's good to have like messy areas because that's what you know nature likes that's what naturally you know it's like it's not really clinical and clean um so we've got loads of teas all here the flowers are covered in different insects in the winter and they capture in the leaves the water from the rainwater, and you get loads of little insects drinking in them um so and also the teasel root apparently is medicinal so, so many of these plants are good for our general health and also they're lovely for you can cut some and have them as decoration so is everything um, perennial uh, almost everything yeah we've got a small annual so we grow some we grow potatoes we've grown yams up here we grow onions garlic um, we grow tomato we've got tomatoes in our polytunnels we grow mitsuma which is kind of like a um, like a mixture between cabbage and salad leaf, which is very nutritious. We grow um, aubergines, ch chilies. So we grow a whole range of annuals. So we do grow annuals up here as well. Um, but it's 90% perennials basically, because that's the most efficient way to grow perennial crops. And because the roots get down deeper, they're a lot um, more nutritious. They gather more nutrients, a lot of perennial crops nuts we've got quite a lot of um, sweet chestnuts we've got quite a few of those trees we've got some um, English varieties and some um, French varieties which produce bigger nuts even in dry weather they're really successful uh, and then we've got uh, walnuts on the land and some some almonds so perennial crops are great because they just get on with it once you've planted them and you've got them got them going after the first year or two they just look after themselves we don't even a lot of our fruit trees we don't even prune them in in the winter just let them get on and they're still producing abundant crops every year sometimes pruning helps get a more regular crop but you don't have to prune the fruit trees to get you know good levels of crops especially with standard fruit trees but, uh, How much um, kind of fertilising do you do? So we do minimal fertilising, especially with the fruit trees. Um, very little. We initially um, mulch them, mulch the trees. We mulch them with wood chip, we grow it from the land with compost. Um, so, but after the first few years, you don't need to because they look after themselves. It's like if you look in a standard woodland, you walk around a woodland, you don't have humans going in and fertilising trees in there. The system is self-sustaining, a woodland ecosystem looks after itself. And that woodland next to us, Middle Wood, that's been there hundreds, if not thousands of years. I mean, it's on some of the old maps, the 1777 maps, and apparently it goes back a lot further than that. So um, eventually forest gardens, they fertilize themselves more so. With the annual crops, we do fertilize, so we do do compost, we've got compost heaps. We've used some rock dust on the land. Some people say that helps with fertility. Uh, if we have a little bonfire, we might use some of the potash. We'll spread that on some of the areas. So, um, so we do need some fertilizer with the annual crops uh, and the perennial crops when we're getting them going. Uh, we've used comfrey. We've grown some comfrey on the land and we've soaked that in water and used that as a bit of a fertilizer with nettles we've added. So we've done. Uh, yeah, minimal fertilising on the land, but uh, but yeah, yeah, it's all good. So we're going to move on from this point. We we'll just um, walk around here. We can see some people relaxing, enjoying the forest.
forest garden over there and that's what nature and land is about as well it's about our own enjoyment it can has multiple benefits on us it can lower connection to nature lowers stress it lowers um, lowers anxiety uh, so there's the as well as the uh, food the fuel materials that we get from this land is the psychological benefit so it's great just to um, be surrounded by nature work in nature interact with it and uh, it feeds our mind which is always something that's ignored a bit in um, conventional farming you know it's all about feeding our bodies but what about our mind because when our body when our minds aren't working so well we consume more food and we get you know obviously obesity is a major problem in this country type 2 diabetes which costs our society billions you know in terms of the NHS so if you have a healthier and a, a mentally stronger population um, that's better for a country financially as well as psychologically uh, you know and physically of course so um, you know we need a farming system in this country that, that helps the people who do the farming as well because there's so much depression amongst farmers so many of them are isolated they're just in a combine harvester or a tractor on their own you know hour after hour day after day and it can be quite quite boring modern day farming and quite and if you're you know farming you know if you're doing dairy farming you're dealing with animals who get sick a lot and aren't well and it's quite quite depressing at times or work you know so it's lovely to be in a system where you're not engaged in exploitation and suffering and monoculture and boredom it's nice to have diversity and uh, you know be surrounded by animals that are f free to come and go you know in terms of the birds and the creatures the insects and so on and so on so it's uh, more of a positive environment far kind of farming environment to work in so uh, yeah Should we walk and have a do an interview with some of the other uh, people who are just enjoying the land over here. Yeah, that's been great. It's been uh, really interesting uh, seeing all the things that you do. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so obviously we're in early May now, we're just after Beltane and um, time of uh, growth, a new, a new, a new life. And here we have some young, uh, <laughs> young, nice young, vibrant couple Sweated. here. <laughs> I'm just smelling the delicious lemon balm. I know, it's lovely. And all of the raspberries here as well as yes, the Yes, that's right. We've got and all the raspberries. are spreading, fruit. it's incredible. Yeah, that's just right. Spreading. spread themselves. And it's the most delicious raspberry. I know, yeah. it's a very it's super a sweet variety. So amazing. Oh, so we have autumn nice. and summer raspberries on the way. And just from a few canes wow. they've spread now. Wow. Yeah. How long will they last? Pardon? How long will they raspberry cane and plant it? How long will that keep on going? Well that will keep going for many, oh, many years, probably 10, 20, and, and then 30 years. And then it just suckers years. and then it just, just spreads. So it's moving all spread. over here, it's yeah. moving over there. So yeah. some of the old. So it's just yeah. sustaining. We, yeah. had, we had an event and it was amazing it was for breakfast and I was with a young person and we just had we had a plum and a few raspberries for breakfast and it was the concentration of the nutrients in it and that was all we didn't need we didn't need any more it was so the most satisfying and it was also a very religious sacred experience of just getting our own food we didn't need any packaging yeah. we didn't need anything like you say the foraging there. how much nature supplies food uh, for free you know in the hedgerows in our woodlands and so on there's so much food out there we can forage we don't need to spend a lot of time farming putting effort we just need to spend time gathering a lot of the time you can get your um, your hazelnuts your crab apples your uh, blackberries your hawthorn berries your stinging nettles your sorrels your so on and so on from nature just for free and mushrooms if you know what you're doing with the mushrooms, make sure you go with somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, and uh, it's all food for free. There's so much abundance out there in, in nature. And we want you know more spaces like that where people can get food for free because that food is some of the best for us. You know, those perennial food crops, things that come up year after year. And things like uh, stinging nettles have such higher levels of potassium, magnesium than 
conventional spinach, for example. So there's lots of health benefits for foraging. We have experts in foraging with us here that can tell you a lot more about that. And I think what's nice about your land in foraging is that you know that there's not pesticides because so often when people forage it's right next to a farmer's field where there are the pesticides which are on the food mm. then even though they're wild it still has that runoff from the field so having more spaces dedicated to being organic then you can forage without that worry in your no, mind no, it's exactly. so important definitely and uh, the land surrounding us, we're lucky there's no intensively farmed land surrounding us and the other small holdings nearby. There's another gentleman who's into forest gardening just over in the corner, a guy called Paul. So he's planted hundreds of fruit trees and so on. So he does a similar thing. It's not quite as, but you could go and have a look if you wanted. It's just up, up there because um, we have a good relationship. And then a lot of the other bits of land around us are just naturally rewild and they've been brought by investors um, as a long-term investment. They're hoping to get planning permission unfortunately for housing some of these people. I don't even know them but at least we're surrounded by land that is not conventionally managed or sprayed so that means we don't get too much cross-contamination. Wonderful. It's a take. Okay, okay. So hopefully <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah. What a wonderful guy. So when I'm put on the spot, I'm not always as natural, which I know you're wonderful. John, it sounded very good. What I could at times it's all right. Yeah. Some of it's all right, but sometimes I'm not. You yeah, know. Well, of course. No, no one can't fit everything into no. half no. an hour. No, but you well, might well, be able to edit out. Well a edited, bit. John. It's, it's yeah. going to be fantastic. You're a hero, John. Yeah. Well, we all creating homes for all these animals. Feeding all these people. Yeah, well, that's Thank you idea. very much. John Barker, John Barker. Maypole Hero, yeah. here in the woodland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for visiting. Thank you very much. Thank you.